Can you test the mic for me? Good morning. Welcome to our All Souls Indie service, which is being held in person and being streamed. I'm Diane Kennedy, your worship associate today, and I'm so glad to see everybody who is here. And I remembered to take my mask off. All Souls strives to be an inclusive congregation where we do our best to live the elements of our covenant. We celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of all people, places, and things. We put love in action by forming community, helping those less fortunate, and working to aid the environment. Like all other All Souls services, we can bring our whole selves to this one. All Souls is a place where we can reconnect with our values and with a support system of community.
Today, our guest minister, Forrest Gilmore, will discuss whether or not to give money to panhandlers. And I just remembered that you are not supposed to say whether or not, because whether is sufficient. <laughs> Reverend Gilmore is the executive director of Beacon Inc., a nonprofit that works with people struggling with hunger and homelessness in Bloomington, Indiana. He's also the community minister for the Unitarian Universalist Church in Bloomington. He's a graduate of Cornell University and Star King School for the Ministry. Good morning and welcome. We come to this time and this place, try it this way, to re rediscover the wondrous gift of free relig religious community, to renew our faith in the holiness, goodness, and beauty of life, to reaffirm the way of the open mind and full heart, to rekindle the flame of memory and hope and to reclaim the vision of an earth made fair with all her people one. sing a few bars, but you might not thank me for that. All right, so I'm going to project. Is that better? Awesome. So each week there's an opportunity to reach back to All Souls and let us know what programs you might be interested in, what pastoral care needs you might have, um, or what kind of programs you might like to see that you don't see yet. So I believe that there are connection cards at the end of the pews. And then if you are observing us online, there's a link in the order of service that you can use, or you can email any of us. You'll see all of our names and email addresses of all the staff on our website and also here in our order of service. The main thing that I particularly do wanna call your attention to next week, uh, as part of our open questions process, we do again have a special congregational meeting after the service, there will be support for young children who might wish to be present during that process or who might wish to be elsewhere during that process. So let me know either way, and we look forward to seeing all of you. And at this time, I would like it very much if Ms. Nadia Carmony would come up and help me light the chalice. So I'm going to pop this mask back on. And while we do so, we will recite the covenant that can be seen on the wall behind us. From that candle, light this from that candle, and then bring it to the big one. This goes there. Take it there, and light it from this flame. There we go. Yep. Hold it down. Hold the black part. There we go. Now you can come light right up here. Perfect. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. And then we can blow it out. Do you want to pull your mask down? And we'll say it together. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is the covenant. Thank you, Nadia. <laughs> nice work. Nice. Anybody <laughs> else? Today, Reverend Gilmore will be talking about whether we should give money to people who panhandle. I've thought about this more than once and often find that my thoughts and my actions are not in sync. 
As a general proposition, I think it's better to give packs of food and water, which we have handily at our immediate disposal for people who are waiting at intersections and interchanges. But I don't come into contact with such folks every day, and I've never actually gotten around to having the packs in my car. Sometimes I'll keep small bills in my cup holder and hand them out when the opportunity arises. But I actually think I do that more so I can pat myself on the back than to really help somebody. On further reflection, I thought about people who approach me at gas stations. On those occasions, I feel unsafe and uncomfortable, which I'm sure doesn't speak well of me. But again, I am a little old lady. Generally, I provide some money, but it occurred to me while I was preparing this part of the service, the folks who come up often either say they need money for gas or money for food. Well, if I'm at a gas station, what I really ought to do is say, well, pull up the car and I will pay for you to fill the tank. And that had never occurred to me. And where I often get gas, there are three fast food places and a grocery store. So I could easily go with them to get food. So we'll see the next time this happens what I do. And I'll let you know if I really do it or not. <laughs> Then there have been the occasions when I actually enjoyed giving money. One of them was a, sign, a guy with a sign at Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. The sign said, I won't lie, it's for the booze. <laughs> and we were entertained by that, so we pitched some money in his bucket. Another time I was in Cincinnati, we were in a small park looking at a statue of a guy on a horse and wondering who he was and why there was a statue there. Statue there. And a guy came up to us and he explained who it was and why there was a statue. And then he said, uh, I'm financially embarrassed. Uh, could you help me out a little bit? And we felt like that had been a fair exchange. And uh, I don't remember anything about the statue. I don't remember who it was, why he was there. But I do remember the story about the guy who was financially embarrassed. Anyway, I'm eager to hear Reverend Gilmore's thoughts, and maybe later, your thoughts. Good morning again. So, our Soul Matters theme for this month is renewing faith. And one of the things that it talks about is renewing faith in our covenants. And so I think this is just such a good weekend to have Reverend Forrest Gilmore in the pulpit, because I think that he might talk a little more about that. But I want to tell you actually a story from one of our sources, our Judeo-Christian sources, um, and tell you a story about Jesus. So some of you know, because you've heard in Spirit Play, the story of the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus used to travel and preach and speak everywhere that he went. What you might not know is this actually wasn't very uncommon back then. There were a lot of people who did this, which if you think about it, makes sense because there was no internet back then. There was no television back then. Precious resources like paper were not widely available, so there weren't really even books about dragons back then or coloring pages, but I know, it's shocking, right? <laughs> so there wasn't really a great way to communicate with large groups of people unless you traveled around and spoke to them. But in Jesus' case, there were hundreds and even thousands of people showing up or following him to hear him speak, and so I think that tells us that right from the beginning, people feel like, felt like he had something special to say. But this was what we call a double-edged sword, which means something that both does what you want it to and sometimes does the opposite of what you want it to. So you kind of got to watch it. Because one day, Jesus went up to a mountain to preach, and there was a lot of grass all around, and a bunch of people came up, and they sat on the grass to hear him speak. And he looked around at how many people there are and he thought to himself, okay, 
if there's one thing I know, it's that if people are going to sit here for a long time, they're going to start to want snacks. <laughs> and so he looked at his disciples, and he knew that the holiday of Passover was coming, right? And like, what do we all do right before a big holiday? We all go shopping. So he kind of knew that there wasn't going to be a lot available to buy, and what there was was going to be kind of expensive. And he said to his disciple, Philip, he, he called him over, and he said, where are we going to get enough bread to feed all these people? And Philip came up to him, and he did not give Jesus the answer that he wanted. He was a little bit upset, and he said, Jesus, it would take six months wages to buy enough bread for all these people. And then he went and sat down, and Jesus said, okay, well, that doesn't really solve my problem at all, but thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Um, so he looked around, and another disciple said to him, you know, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. And Jesus looked at the five barley loaves and the two fish, and he looked at the people. And I mean, look around. Are there 5,000 people in here? I don't think so. Is five barley loaves and two fish going to be enough to feed all the people in this room? No. If that was how much Jimmy John's we had bought for the last open questions meeting, we would have been in some trouble. So, but he didn't know what else to do, so he said, okay, hand it out. So they started passing these things around, and it just sort of seemed to work. Like, no one was cranky, and everyone seemed to be fed. And at the end, he said, listen, I don't want to leave a mess, so go around and gather up what's left and bring it up here. And you're not going to believe what happened. By the time the disciples had finished gathering everything, they were huffing, and they were puffing, and they came up with these big baskets, and they said, listen, there's 12 more where these came from. And I mean, their backs were bent, man. Like, they, it was a lot of bread. So you can sit down. You're cool. So when the disciples looked at this, they said, gosh, this is indeed the prophet that was prophesied because this is a miracle that got worked here today, that there was enough bread for all these thousands of people. And that's interesting to think about because there's really more than one way to look at this. And they're all correct in Unitarian Universalism. There's not necessarily a wrong way. So one way is all hope was lost. There was nothing we could do. We'd done everything we could do, and a miracle happened. A miracle is kind of like magic, but it's something that, that a higher power does and makes possible. So that is one reading of this story. Another one is that kind of the stone soup answer, that when people saw that there wasn't enough food for everybody, they said, oh, well, I did have some bread in my bag. I did have a couple of fish here to feed my friends. And they started to share them around and to keep covenant with each other. So I think a good thing to wonder about today would be, which of those two answers is the one that speaks to your heart? And what spiritual food can you get from the story of the loaves and the fishes? Thank you. Each week, we share joys and sorrows as part of our spiritual practice of community and our covenant to live with the spirit of love. Our sorrows today are with the Ukrainian people as they suffer an invasion, the Uyghur people in China as they suffer enslavement, and the Rohingya people as they suffer from genocide. Our joys are more localized. We share joy with Sandy Ryberg, as she is doing well from her surgery last month, and with Teddy Rayhill, whose show has opened, and with Nasreen, who has her dog back. Yeah, we'll have to 
I need some WD-40 or something. <laughs> so I invite us in this uh, time, in this place, to enter into a spirit of prayer and meditation and contemplation as we join in gentle silence together. Holy and loving mystery within us, around us, and beyond us, we enter into this sacred space of community to, to learn and to love, to open our hearts and our minds to ourselves, to each other, to that which is beyond us. In times of great tragedy, we need to be reminded to allow in gratitude, to allow in joy, the little things and the big things that bring those to us, a child born, a wedding, the daffodils returning, the air warming, community regathering. We need to hold that gratitude and give it, let it give us strength because we need strength. We need to be strong. There's so much in life that also challenges us, calls us to our greatness, but also can cause, cause great struggle and hardship. And we hold those things too. We think around. We think upon the many nations throughout our world that are in the midst of war. Of course, we think upon Ukraine and the people of Ukraine. And may we also think upon Yemen and Syria and Afghanistan and at least. 17 other nations that are currently at war throughout the world. May we also think about our governor as he debates whether to sign the transgender bill related to banning transgender girls in girls' sports. And we hope that his hand is guided by love and integrity and dignity as he makes that decision to sign or not sign that bill. And there may be other challenges that we hold in our hearts, a death, an injury, a loss of work, an illness, all of these things we carry in our hearts, all of these struggles we hold dear. May we use the strength of gratitude and of love and of community to build our hearts and to build our minds so that we also may be able to handle the hardships of life with a stiff back and wide open hands. For all these things and so much more, Amen. It's really nice to be with you again, to join you today. Um, last time I was with you was uh, just uh, early in the pandemic, and we've come a long way <laughs> since then. Uh, it's been quite a time, and I know that Joel right now is, is out and struggling with um, some uh, repercussions of a concussion, and so, um, so I'm happy to just step in here today to kind of help him as he deals with, those, with that challenge. Um, the... Um, Words that I'd like to use to center us today in today's sermon are, come from St. Francis. And he said, 
No one knows his name. A man who lives on the streets and walks around in rags. Once I saw that man and in a dream. He and God were building an extraordinary temple. I've been uh, working in homeless services for the last 12 years. And um, it's been absolutely a transformative aspect of my life. Not something I ever predicted I would end up in in doing. And somehow also while I'm in it f has felt so natural to suddenly be in this work. And in that, in that work, perhaps more than any other question um, that I get asked, and I get asked many questions about this, about homelessness and the issue of homelessness, but one question I get asked probably more than any is, should I give money to people who are panhandling? And panhandling, I think, is a really interesting experience because it's one of the most direct ways that most of us come in contact with people in extreme poverty. It's one of the few opportunities, in fact, that when we actually can have an engagement with someone who's experiencing extreme poverty. And in the question of should I give money to this person before me who's, who's, who's panhandling, should I or shouldn't I, there's this immediate confrontation. It's not just a simple question. It's immediate confrontation that has layers and upon layers. And I think there's a deeper question that runs under that, which is sometimes the question of, am I a good person? That that confrontation puts that challenge before us and asks us that deeper question. And I think that's why this engagement with people in that, in that moment challenges us so much. And that's why we seek guidance around it. Somehow we struggle with what to do. We long to be compassionate and kind. Um, we hate that people live in such poverty. And this encounter is this unfiltered exposure to some, something that we sometimes can turn off, that we live in a society that creates this, this kind of poverty, that it exists, that human beings have to live like that, and that we may be partly responsible for that, that also can, all these things can occur to us. And that can hit us right in the heart with grief, and anger, and maybe even fear, is very natural responses to that encounter. A lot happens just in this simple engagement of someone asking us for money. Martha Beck, um, she's an author and a, a workshop leader and things, some of you may know her. She, um, she talks about, and she uses this in quotes, she talks about our bag lady fears. That on a core, deep level, we all are on some level terrified that we too could one, one day end up in those same circumstances. So that even emerges for us too in the, in the encounter of someone in, that, in those circumstances. So the question of panhandling also tests our own understanding of what we think about substance use. While many people in poverty and also people who, who panhandle do not use alcohol or drugs in ways that are harmful to themselves, some do. What if I give this money to this person and they use it to get, to get high? Am I supporting their addiction? Am I complicit in pre preventing them from seeking recovery? And then, of course, there's the fear of being conned. We've all heard some story of a panhandler who dresses up in disheveled clo clothing every day, pretending to be poor, and then goes home to a beautiful apartment paid for through our naivety. And that um, often hits the news every couple of years, some story like that. I actually saw a video a while back of a person who um, actually faked being disabled with something that looked like cerebral palsy. It was quite an incredible uh, act and it was actually, uh, it was actually kind of impressive in a, in a horrible manipulative sort of way. And there's, you know, and then, you know, there's the threat factor too. Am I safe? What if this person is dangerous? What if they do something that's, that's unpredictable to me and I don't know how to respond? And of course, there's also the fear of giving, giving too much away. I only have so much money. Each of us 
you know, has, has limits financially. How much do I give? I can't give it all away. And then, and then there's something also that's hard to talk about, but it's important to raise, which is um, the disgust factor. The feeling when confronting someone experiencing extreme poverty of disgust that some of us can sometimes experience um, in that encounter, depending on the circumstances. Some of you I know are fans of, uh, of Game of Thrones, a little dated now but as, as a series, but I know some of you are fans of that, of course, and some of you may remember the character, the High Sparrow in that, in that show, and like character that work with people in poverty um, in the series. And he offered some really interesting and I think biting commentary in the show, and he said, the poor are hard to love. They disgust us because they, they are us, shorn of our illusions. They show us what we'd look like without our fine clothes and how we'd smell without perfume. I thought that was a pretty fascinating kind of analysis of that. I first um, dealt with panhandling in a fairly significant way long before I started working at Beacon, where I am now, with people who are homeless. It was during seminary in Berkeley, California in the 90s. And there was a major street, some of you might be familiar with Berkeley, that ran north-south through town. It's called Telegraph Avenue. And lots of people panhandled on that street. Lots and lots of people. And to walk down Telegraph, it was pretty much guaranteed that you would have, that you would be asked for money, and often multiple times within a few short blocks. There were just lots of people there, and all asking for money. And I remember struggling with it. I hated to say no. It brought up all kinds of insecurities and self-judgment in me. It was uh, tough to say no. And be, being confronted with that question, I had to time specifically avoid Telegraph Avenue to avoid the discomfort of saying no, and maybe also the discomfort of saying no to people who were so clearly in pain. My fe fellow seminarians would often talk about it. We'd often talk about Telegraph Avenue and what do we do? How do we approach it? What should we be doing in that kind of care, that encounter? And I eventually d decided on a particular strategy. I'd be kind. I'd acknowledge people. I'd look at them. I'd maybe talk with them, say hello or something. And then I would, to the request for money, I would say no. Usually some variant like, I'm, I'm sorry, no. And then I would give money to the local homeless shelter. That was my plan. The thing is, I never did give money to the local homeless shelter. <laughs> I went as far as looking up who the local homeless shelter was, but I never took the step to give them money, at least not back then. So what should you do in these encounters? Ultimately, there, there really is no right answer, of course. The decision is yours, and only yours, and I don't want that to feel like a cop-out, cop out, but that's just simply the truth. There is no right answer to this question. But here are some possible pros and cons to whichever choice you might make. On the pro side to giving money to people who are experiencing panhandling, you are directly giving to a person which might feel more immediate and more powerful to you, that you're having this direct encounter with an individual and you're supporting that direct person. Your gift might also help that person purchase something that is not easily or abundantly available through the services in the community. It could be clothing or bus tickets or gas or medication or even a meal out. Keeping those who are panhandling visible also helps remind us that poverty exists something that some in our society are keen to forget. It's, it's also, I think, important to remember that panhandling is a legal activity which has been protected as a form of free speech. Because when you take away all the layered associations uh, on top of the word pa panhandling, it really is a very, very simple thing. It's a person asking another person for money. It's just a question. And that's all there, there is. There are, there are, of course, however, certain illegal ways 
of panhandling that are not legal, depending on what community you live in. In Bloomington, following a person is not illegal. Uh, it is not legal. Asking for money after dark is not legal. Um, soliciting near a bank or an ATM is not legal. I'm not as familiar with what the laws are here in, here in Indianapolis, but I imagine there's some overlap there. On the con, <clears throat> on the con side, your purchase, your money could be used to purchase something you don't want to, for the recipient of your money to buy. You know, it could go to alcohol, or it could go to tobacco, or it could go to other drugs. Some people claim that giving to panhandlers attracts unwanted attention and may lead to aggressive and illegal forms, or unwanted behavior, sorry, and may lead to aggressive and illegal forms of panhandling. And sadly, it's possible that um, you could give money to someone who may not be representing themselves honestly. So those are all, you know, cons. So I have two core points of advice for you in the, in the act of making your decision. First, I, I recommend that you say hello. Between 1999 and 2019, there were 1,852 recorded acts of violence committed against homeless individuals by housed perpetrators in the United States, and countless more unrecorded acts. 515 people lost their lives as a result of those attacks. They were murdered, approximately 20 per year. That's double the combined total of all hate crime related, related murders of people in protected classes. And about the same number of trans, transgender people who are murdered every year. So it's pretty significant violence directed at people experiencing homelessness. I remember one of our guests coming into our center uh, one day and he had been uh, beaten uh, and he was bruised and stitched and his face was so swollen that he was hard to recognize. He told me that a young man jumped out of the back of a pickup truck with a two by four and struck him across the face. And he was lucky to be, to be alive, honestly. To be on the streets is a derogatory experience where you are routinely ignored, questioned, humiliated, spit on, and threatened just for being there. There have been studies that have shown that people on the streets are more likely to stir our sense of disgust, and we are for, far more likely to treat people we encounter on the streets as less than human. Some years ago, I went on a street retreat in San Francisco where I lived on the streets of the Tenderloin for, for a week, for seven days. Just lived out there as part of this retreat with other, other individuals to um, take in that experience and to learn as much as I could through that experience. And one of the most valuable moments I had on the streets was when someone remembered my name. In the entire week that I was out there, only one person uh, called me by my name. So I encourage you to say hello as one thing to do in that encounter. Secondly, I encourage you to give, but knowing there are different ways to do that. I remember my dad one day telling me a story about how he had built a relationship with a man on the street. Uh, he worked in New York City and regularly encountered this man and they had gotten to know each other over the years. He would give him some money, he would talk to him, ask him how he was doing. And it was something over many years that I didn't know about my father. I didn't know he did it and it, and it surprised me. Um, and, and when he told me about it, something changed. I saw my dad in a, in a different way. I saw him in a way that um, my teenage self didn't understand about, about him. From interviews of people panhandling, when we actually interview them and talk to them about what they do, we know that people, they average about $100 per week panhandling. So they're not making a massive amount of money generally. They're making about $100 per week. And we also know that it's about as twice as likely that they will buy food 
as alcohol or drugs. So it's about two times more likely they're going to spend that money on, on, on food over, um, over alcohol or drugs. And that is, is equally likely that they will buy a place to sleep for the night with that money as they might use it for alcohol and drugs. So, um, so money can go towards, it doesn't always automatically go to alcohol and drugs even though we worry that it might. Sometimes it goes to those other things also. Sometimes money allows people to buy things that they can't from homeless organizations also like batteries or boots or phone minutes. But wherever it goes, you are creating an opportunity. Wherever that money goes when you give money freely to someone on the street, wherever it goes, you are doing something very interesting in that you are creating an opportunity for that person to make their own choices. Even if they are choices you wouldn't make. And there's an empowerment in that. And, and it's, uh, there's a dignity to that. Um, and that's something we talk about often with the social workers that work at my organization that we talk about this, is that sometimes our clients will make decisions that we really, really don't like. But there's an empowerment to, for lack of better words, allowing that or supporting them to make those decisions that are their decisions. And I'll say this, no, um, you're not enabling addiction by giving money to someone who struggles with substance use. That if you do give money and they do use it for alcohol and addictions, I'm going to say this. In my opinion, you're not actually enabling that addiction. Because addiction is an incredibly complicated issue, often having to do with genetics, massive childhood trauma, crumbling community and a fading economy, and basically very little, if anything, to do with the exchange of a few bucks on the street. So, in my opinion, I would encourage you to, to release that worry, even if it does get spent on such things, because addiction is so much more complicated, and people who do have addictions will find a way to get that drug until they're in a place to make that change around recovery. But if you do decide to make a gift, whatever you do, once you make that gift, I encourage you to not worry about where it goes, to just release it with joy. If you make that gift, just make it, and don't worry about what happens next. Release it with joy. If, however, money doesn't feel right to you, and that's a perfectly legitimate uh, choice. I give money sometimes, but truthfully, very rarely. Um, I usually give other things or um, give to organizations, but... If money doesn't feel right to you, and that's okay, you can give in other ways. You could uh, buy the person a sandwich or a cup of coffee, just like uh, Dan was talking about, or carry around some bus tickets to hand, to hand out. Some people, they create, again, like Diane was talking about, they create little gift packets with things like socks or um, travel-sized toothpaste or deodorant or maybe a candy bar to give to people. I know uh, lots of families in particular who do this, and this is a, a way they make the kits with their children, and they, they, it's kind of a nice activity for families to do, and then they give them out with their children. And lastly, one way you can, another way you can give is to just to give to organizations that help. Give of your time and of your money. These organizations are doing good, often incredibly difficult work, whether it's the kindness of a good meal or a safe place to sleep or the impact of a job or home. And wealthy donors generally historically have tended to favor education and the arts. And there's little federal and state funding directed at people in poverty. So homeless organizations rely on everyday donors to make it possible for them to do what they do. And as an example, Horizon House is a local organization here in Indianapolis whose work I can recommend if you're thinking about a local organization that you want to support. I, I feel very good about them as an organization. So, say hello and give. Ultimately, and I, I say this with some caution, but I also say this with some candor, but ultimately, what we choose to do in these circumstances, in this encounter of a person experiencing pan panhandling, what we choose to do in that counter, encounter is, in fact, a test. 
but it's not necessarily a test where there's an externally imposed right answer for every encounter. I don't have the right answer. It's more like a take-home test whose goal is to help us learn and reflect. That encounter gives us an opportunity to learn and to reflect. And as I mentioned earlier, panhandling is one of the few opportunities most of us ever have to engage a person experiencing extreme poverty. This opportunity to engage offers us this precious moment to reflect on who we want to be on, as people and how we manifest our covenant in the, to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I think we struggle with the question of whether to give money to people who are panhandling so much because we, we know this on some level. The panhandling encounter serves as a microcosm of our society's struggles with poverty, offering us a moment to review who we want to be in that struggle. And that's also why it is such an, an opportunity for each of us to live out our values and in some small way build a better world. St. Francis said, no one knows his name. A man who lives on the streets and walks around in rags. Once I saw that man in a dream. He and God were building an extraordinary temple. When we think about St. Francis's dream, I think it's important to ask ourselves where he and God are building that temple. They're building that temple in our hearts. Shalom, amen, and blessed be. And I invite us now to join together in song. Let me grab my order. Number 20, Be Thou My Vision. And is your tradition to rise? Is that the... <laughs> Why don't we rise together as you are able? And um, are you singing or humming? <laughs> oh. Oh yeah, we didn't do the offering after the meditation. All right. We'll do that after the song. Thank you. Good call. All right.
If I'm not mistaken, we're closing in on the end of our annual pledge drive. Unlike NPR, we do not have a variety of thank you gifts based on your level of giving. But we do still have some nice coffee mugs. If you haven't turned in your pledge card, please do so. For this week's offering, the entire plate, unless you mark your check or offering envelope otherwise, uh, or online donation, will go to the minister's discretionary fund, which the minister can then use to assist members and others in the community with some immediate need. Whether it's unexpected medical bills, rent, car repair bills, or some other emergency. Joel's indicated to me that this fund has met some very real and very unexpected needs of members of this congregation. We might all be there at some point. While I've never been destitute, I have had times when I wasn't sure how I was going to make ends meet. Was I was going to pay the credit card or was I going to pay the rent? The notion of some sort of safety net through the church would have been very reassuring even if I never needed to resort to it. For this reason, I have given generously to all souls and hope that you will as well. We will now collect the morning offering. from Frederick Gillis. May the love which overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all fears, which reconciles all who are separated, be in us and among us, now and always. May we go in peace. <laughs> 